The key to a healthy future, that seems kind of an ambiguous title, pretty broad. And I'm sure there are many keys to a healthy future. Eating right would be one of those keys. I heard the story of a guy that went to heaven, and he was just so overwhelmed with how beautiful it was. He and his wife were standing there just beholding the glories of heaven. And he turned to her angrily and said, Gladys, if you hadn't insisted on all that wheat, germ, vitamins, and roughage, we could have been here 10 years earlier. <laughs> Exercise is probably the key to a healthy future as well. The other day, I had the strongest urge to go run a mile. And I'm just feeling better. Somebody asked, what did you do? I laid down on the sofa till that urge went away. <laughs> it's important to get sleep. If you're going to have a healthy future, getting enough sleep is important. Someone uh, years ago quoted a little poem that someone had written. Mary had a little lamb. I think it was a sheep. It joined a charismatic church and died from lack of sleep. (laughs) But this is what scientific research has shown. And Let me quote Dr. Katie Woodland of Woodland Psychological Services. These are her words. If you're not proactively supporting your emotional well-being, then when things get tough, your mental and physical health will decline. I'm serious. This isn't a maybe. Without a high level of emotional well-being, you really will get ill. You could develop a mental health condition like depression, anxiety, or even schizophrenia. You may even develop a physical health condition like cancer, heart disease, or type 2 diabetes. So if what she is saying is true, if emotional well-being is the number one key to a healthy future, What is the number one key to emotional well-being? I believe it's forgiveness. Forgiving yourself and forgiving others is the number one key to a healthy future. Nothing wrecks our emotional well-being like unforgiveness. The creator of mind, body, and spirit has given us the ultimate guide to embracing this key of forgiveness. For he is the master of forgiveness. How many of you are glad you've been forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ? This morning... I want you to listen. I want you to take notes. I want you to open your heart because I can tell you this word is for you as much as it is for me. First of all, let's talk about what forgiveness is not. Number one, forgiveness is not denying that the offense occurred. Jesus had no problem at all identifying offensive behavior. Do you remember When Jesus spoke of the Pharisees, and he said this. He said, the Pharisees and teachers of the law are experts in the law of Moses. He wasn't criticizing them here. He was telling these people, they are saying the truth to you. They are experts in the law. And then he said this to them, so obey everything they teach you. They're great teachers. They've they've studied. They've embraced the law. They've mastered it. So when they preach to you, do everything that they teach you. But then he said, but don't do as they do. After all, they say one thing and they do something else. They pile heavy burdens on people's shoulders and they won't lift a finger to help. They, everything they do is just to show off in front of others. They even make a big show of wearing scripture verses on their foreheads and arms and they wear big tassels for everybody to see. They love the best seats at banquets and the front seats at the meeting places. And when they are in the market, they like to have people greet them as great teachers. Paul, 
in 2 Timothy 4.14 also identified an offense. This is what he said. He said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. It's important for you to understand that forgiveness is not denying that an offense has occurred. You don't deny the offense. It happened. You really were abused as a little boy or a little girl. You really were ripped off by your business partner. You really were offended by that individual who willfully said things that they know will hurt you. You really did get to a place in your life of such torment with the individual that you were married to because of their affairs and because of their duplicity that you finally had to get out of the marriage at great cost. All of that happened. And forgiveness is never denying that the offense occurred. Secondly, forgiveness does not mean that you take the blame for what you did not do. There are those that think the part of the process of forgiveness is you taking the blame for things you didn't do. Remember this. The only way that people get set free is through embracing truth. And if it is not the truth that you did something, don't you take blame for it because God will not bring freedom out of a lie. Forgiveness is not saying you did it or it was your fault when it is not the truth. Number three, forgiveness is not something you do for somebody else. I've heard people say, I don't care if they beg me, I'd never forgive them. Well, I want to tell you, whether you forgive them or not, it's not affecting or impacting them at all. Forgiveness is not something you do for somebody else. You somehow feel you're letting people off the hook when you forgive them. That's ridiculous. It's not going to affect their lifestyle or quality of life one iota if you forgive them or if you don't. You don't do forgiveness for somebody else. You do forgiveness for you, for your quality of life. Forgiveness is about your healthy future. It's about you being free. It's about you being spiritually and emotionally at your best. How many of you think that's the will of God? Number four. Forgiveness is not difficult. Unforgiveness is difficult. The Bible gives us simple steps to forgiveness, all of which are very doable. And may I say, do is the operative word here. Because forgiveness is something you do. You need to remind the person to the right and the left of that. Will you just turn and say, it's something you do. Just tell them that. They need to know that. The fifth thing that forgiveness is not is you don't have to feel forgiving in your heart to authentically forgive. Some of you have not forgiven someone because you say, I don't feel it. It wouldn't be real. Folks, please understand the way that your whole psyche works. Feelings follow actions. Actions do not follow feelings. Let me say it again. Feelings follow actions. Actions do not follow feelings. How many of you feel that if you left right now, you already got something? Okay, but that's not even the beginning of the message. Because now we're going to get right into the Word of God. How many of you are ready to get into God's Word? Why do we forgive? That's the second question. Why do we forgive? First of all, I wanted you to understand what forgiveness is not. And then secondly, I want you to understand why we forgive. Number one, we forgive because Jesus commanded us to forgive. In Mark eleven twenty five 25 through 26, this is still a shocking scripture every time I read it. I can tell you it stood me straight up in my spirit this morning one more time when I read the words of Jesus. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. 
But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. How many of you will say, if that's all I heard this morning, that's enough to make me want to forgive? You see, forgiveness is all about the heart of Jesus and what he desires for us. Did you notice in the scripture what he says? He says, you have a heavenly father who is so anxious to forgive you. Release him to do that by forgiving. This is not a thing of Jesus hammering us or threatening us or blackmailing us. The Father's going to hold you hostage if you don't forgive. No, no, no. Jesus is just out of the goodness and love of his heart saying to us, you have no idea how much the Father wants to forgive you. Just go ahead and let your grievance go. And he will forgive you of everything. How many of you right now can just lift your hands and just let that flow through you for a second? Come on, just lift your hands and say, Lord Jesus, I want you to forgive me for everything. Every idle word, every idle thought. Lord, cleanse me. And Lord, I'm willing to forgive, to have the joy of your forgiveness. Secondly, we forgive because forgiveness brings freedom and unforgiveness brings torment. As surely as forgiveness brings freedom, unforgiveness brings torment. In Matthew 18 and 21, we have the parable of the unmerciful servant. You can read along with me on the screen. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. And Peter thought he was being generous. And then Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. How many of you would like to have that for retirement right now? was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay everything back. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. How many of you know that was one generous man? But when that servant, the one who had been forgiven, went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Pretty big disparity between 10,000 bags of gold and a hundred silver coins, wouldn't you say? He grabbed him and began to choke him, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it back, but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master, and listen to this, handed him over to the jailers to be tortured. In the King James Version, it says, to the tormentors, until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It's interesting how tormented some people are by the offenses that they have experienced in their distant past. I talk to a wife and a husband in counseling after they had been married for 40 years. And this wife was still crying fresh tears over what had happened on their honeymoon. Why? Because she had never forgiven. 
So she was tormented, listen to this, with 40 years of offense. It had just piled up. It had just accrued. Some of you are still offended over what happened when you were 12 years old. You're still offended over what happened when you were growing up in your home and you're 60 years old and about to retire and still tormented. Why? Because you failed to see that there is a reason why we forgive. We forgive because as surely as forgiveness brings freedom, unforgiveness brings torment. And listen to me. If you are being tormented by offenses of the past, if you're continually talking about what happened to you in your past, then the good news is this. Jesus has come to this place today so that you can have a face-to-face -face encounter and you can never live in torment again. I've heard people say, I guess I'll always be bothered by it, only if you choose. Because we serve the Lord that shed his blood to set captives emotionally and spiritually and psychologically free. Amen. Thirdly, we forgive because forgiveness creates a healthy future for you and your children. Not only are you affected by unforgiveness, your children and your children's children and your children's children's children will be affected by unforgiveness. I love the two stories of forgiveness that um, I feel are twin stories in Genesis. Um, in Genesis 45, we, um, we see the story of what I call Joseph's reveal. Joseph, as you know, was the young man who was so loved by his father that his father unwisely gave him a coat that he didn't give any of the other guys. He had 12 sons, and he gave Joseph a coat of many colors, and he made no bones about it because Joseph was the child of his old age. He openly loved him more than all the rest of the boys. The Bible says it. And so they just hated him. And that hate turned into a murderous thing. They decided they were going to kill him one day. And then reason prevailed. And they said, well, let's just don't kill him. Let's sell him into slavery. And I can't imagine what Joseph felt like as a 17-year-old boy when he was tied to a chain. And he was marched out of his home with all of the other slaves on the way to Egypt. And he looked back over his shoulders and saw his brothers laughing. Do you ever get over a scar like that? But to make a long, exciting, and one of the best stories in the world short today, this is what happened. Joseph went to Egypt and through trials and tribulations and visitations of God and revelations of the Holy Spirit, he was able to become the second in command of the entire empire. He is the vice president of Egypt and he is in charge of a food supply in a time of worldwide famine. And Jacob, his dad, and all of his evil brothers began to experience the effects of the famine. So they make their way like all of the other citizens that can get to Egypt. They make their way to Egypt. And so now they're standing before this vice president of Egypt who's dressed in royalty. And of course, they haven't seen their little brother since he became a man. And they don't even recognize him. And this is his chance. I had a friend of mine that said, Denny, I wish you would write a book. I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, you need to write a book and say, now it's my turn, you rascals. 
I said, I'd never write that book. And he said, why? I said, because none of that information exists in me anymore. I've forgiven it. I've forgotten it. And I don't plan to ever revisit it. But oh, was this moment the moment for Joseph? This was his opportunity. Now it's my turn, you rascals. I remember looking over my shoulder, sobbing my eyes out, my heart beating with fear out of my chest as I was chained to a slave train and looking over my shoulder and watching you laughing and mocking me and now you've come for food and you are under my command and I have people to the left and the right of me that are armed and ready to take your head off your shoulders if I speak the word. It's my turn. But it didn't happen. No, Joseph had a revelation of forgiveness And I want to read you his words because they're priceless. This is the moment when he's going to reveal himself to his brothers. Listen to these words. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. He wanted to be alone with his brothers. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. Can't you just see him as he begins to haltingly and sobbingly get the words out he said I'm Joseph I'm Joseph does my father still live he wanted to ask that question with all of his heart but his brothers couldn't answer him because they were and I love the way the word puts it dismayed at his presence you think And Joseph said to his brothers, please, please come near me. Come near me. So they came near and he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing or harvesting and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of his house and ruler throughout the land of Egypt. Hurry, go go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near to me. You and your children and your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. That's what forgiveness does. It gives you a future your children of future, and your children's children of future. Hallelujah. But there's another story just like it. You know, previously in in Genesis, during this story, Joseph was a small boy. And I'm sure that he remembered part of this story as a night of terror because he had never seen His dad, Jacob, this terrified. He had never seen him quite as afraid as he was on this night. Something had happened to Jacob. He had had a new experience with God. And Joseph, I'm sure, could tell. But at the same time, he was afraid. Because his dad, Jacob, had been very much like his brothers had been to him. Jacob had betrayed his older brother Esau. Esau had the birthright, which meant he was the firstborn, and that meant that he was going to get the major portion of the inheritance. He would get the oldest son's inheritance, which was the lion's share. But Jacob cleverly and deceptively figured out a way to wrest the blessing from his hand. Sure enough, He took it, and Esau swore that he would kill him. 
And he tried. So Jacob left. Jacob found two ladies that he married, Leah and Rachel. They began to have a family. And then Jacob got the news he had dreaded all of his life. Esau's coming. Esau's coming. And he's coming with a great army. And he knew it was over. It was judgment day. Esau was going to deal with him. Esau was going to give him what he deserved. But instead, something very different happened. In fact, Uncle Esau sounds a lot like Joseph when he met with his brothers. Here's what the Bible says. He said, And Esau ran to meet him. He embraced him. He fell on his neck. He kissed him. They wept. He lifted up his eyes and he saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children. This is the first time the cousins are meeting each other. And they bowed themselves in honor. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And then Joseph and Rachel came and bowed themselves. And he said, what meanest thou by all of this drove which I met? And he said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. Joseph had prepared a payoff. He was going to give him a lot of stuff just to hope that Esau wasn't mad at him. And then Esau responds and says, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have unto yourself. You see, when Joseph stands before his brothers, he has an example of long ago. And he had heard the story repeated many times around the family circle fire. Uncle Esau had every right to take my dad out, but he didn't do it. Instead, he forgave him. And I am going to forgive my brothers too. You say, what's the significance of that? Well, the 12 tribes of Israel were going to come from the brothers that were in that room. If Joseph doesn't forgive his brothers, if he doesn't forgive them totally and completely, then the 12 tribes of Israel as we know them would have ceased to exist at that moment. Do you understand that in heaven, the names of those 12 sons of Jacob are emblazoned upon the pillars of the holy city? Do you understand that they are the foundation not only of Judaism but of Christianity? Do you know how important one act of forgiveness was? And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you this. You will never in your life know how important one act of forgiveness will be to your children and to your children's children. Clear the slate. Empty the closet. Free your heart and mind of unforgiveness and allow God to give you a destiny, a future, and a legacy in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. How do we forgive? How do we forgive? Number one, be honest about your own offenses as compared to the offenses of others. Anybody here a sinner but besides me? Then why are you mad at anybody? No, I'm serious. Well, I'd never do that. Yes, you would. You have. And you'll probably do it again. You want to be a forgiving person? The very first place you got to land is this. Be honest about your own offenses as compared to the offenses of others. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. 
Let me read you the statement by the Apostle Paul. How many of you think that he's pretty, probably in, was probably in pretty good standing with Jesus? That's what he says. Listen, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Everybody say, I do. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would receive in him and believe in him and receive eternal life. I was so angry at Deonza one night, and y'all are going to have to forgive me for that. But I was. And she had just annoyed me. And as one of the ladies in our church would say, she got on my last nerve. I was huffing and puffing, and I was giving her a speech that I didn't dare give her to her face. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly, and this is what he said. He said, uh, would you choose her sins or yours? I said, hers, because she's so much right, more righteous than I am. And the Lord said, then be quiet. How many of you are glad when the Lord just makes short work of your disobedience? Might as well just get rid of it and go on with life, right? You know, I remember the love that flooded me in that moment as I began to realize this wonderful woman that I'd married. And I said, oh, God, please forgive me for my arrogance. What arrogance <sighs> that I would ever, ever want to judge somebody that lives like she lives and loves the way that she loves. You say, well, have you had any problems since then? That's none of your business. I'm telling the story, okay? <laughs> Secondly, this is how we forgive. We follow the scriptural steps to doing, doing. Luke 6 says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. How many of you understand that's a little too broad? Because that seems to morph into a feeling, doesn't it? That's why Jesus becomes very specific with the rest of this passage. He says, do good to those who hate you. Now, I want you to write these statements down because they're important. Returning good for evil is the proof that others' actions cannot control you. I'm going to say it again. Returning good for evil is the proof that others' actions cannot control you. I know that Tommy was talking about a situation at Evangel University back when I was a coach, and I had you know, two or three coaches that kind of had this mutiny thing and they turned on me and, you know, tried to take some of the players to another university and got another job. And it was just one of those deals. I honestly hadn't thought about it in years. But he brought it up and this is what he said to me. He said, Coach, I just appreciated the way that you introduced those guys to the team and you sent them off with honor and you talked about all the good things they had done and said all of us sat there knowing what they had really done. And I looked at Tommy and I said this. I said, well, it wasn't the way I felt, Tommy. And he said, well, you could have fooled me. I said, well, that wasn't the intention. But what you have to understand is I don't do what I do in relationship to forgiveness ever because I'm feeling it on the inside. I do it because those are the instructions. You see, that's why we have the Word of God. Because the Word of God gives us hard, fast 
ways that we can move forward in righteousness. We forgive, listen to me, simply because we are told to forgive and then we forgive how we are told to forgive. And Jesus says this, do good to those who hate you. I'll never forget the story of Abraham Lincoln who promoted this captain who was openly critical of him, promoted the captain to general in the Civil War. And the young man who was this brash Union commander and soldier came in and he said, I don't understand, sir. And he said, what don't you understand? You know that I've been openly critical of you. And now that you would put me in this position, Abraham Lincoln looked at him and said, you're in this position because you're the best man for the job. And the other thing I want you to understand, young man, is that what you think of me will never be allowed to control what I think of you. That's what Jesus was talking about. He's talking about freedom. That we do good to those that hate us because we're in control. If I want to bless you and your children, even though you've cursed me and my children, I have the right to do that. Watch me. You can't stop me. The power of God is in me. Next, we bless those that curse us. Jesus said, bless those that curse you. I want you to remember this. Blessing is the only power that destroys a curse. Blessing is the only power that destroys a curse. Now, listen to me when I talk to you a little bit deeper about what criticism can do. Criticism is a curse. Offense is a curse. Words that bruise are a curse. Evil actions and abuse are curses. Why is it that it seems those that have been abused as children have a veil over their eyes? That it seems as though there's, there's darkness over them and they can't quite break out sometimes. It's because when they were abused and when they were violated and when that dad constantly spoke those words of, you're no good, you'll never accomplish anything. Why can't you be more like your brother? That those words became a curse. And curses are very real. The only way to break a curse is with a blessing. You reverse a curse with a blessing. So when someone curses you, you need to reverse it. Don't deal with it. Don't smolder in it. Don't seethe because of it. No, throw it off of you. Hallelujah. You're no good. You're just a hypocrite. Boy, immediately, you've got to have words come out of your mouth that say this. I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. I am everything the Word of God says that I am. And I also bless you. I speak blessings on you so that you might be untangled and unfettered from every curse that comes back upon your life. You see, when people curse us, we want to throw another curse on them. And so both of us leave bound. But we as those that have been redeemed and have been sought and chosen by God to bring redemption have the great power not only to free ourselves but to free others through blessing. We have the power of blessing in our mouth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't leave the air polluted by curses. Return blessing. And then Jesus said this. He said, pray for those who mistreat you. Pray for those who mistreat you. The other day I was just going through one of my old Bibles. And I went to the back of the Bible. And you know what happened? Right in the back of the Bible I had a list of names. And I looked at those names and I went, oh, 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 that's my enemies list. <laughs> now let me just say this to you. I never disliked or hated any of those people. But they really disliked me. And all of those people, in some way or another, were trying to make my life more difficult. They'd come against the church. They'd come against the school, whatever. And so I wrote all their names down. Everyone that I knew didn't like me. Everyone that was coming against me, I wrote it. And I thought the list was surprisingly long. Here's the amazing thing. 
is that when I went down that list, this was from some years ago, listen to me, every one of the people on that list had been dealt with and most had been reconciled. How in the world did that happen? Through just doing instructions. Can I tell you that this stuff really works? So what you do is this. When you're having trouble with somebody, put them on your enemies list. You say, oh, that's terrible that you have enemies. Well, why in the world would Jesus say that we were to pray for our enemies and, and we were to do good to our enemies if we weren't going to have some? Jesus knew we were going to have some or he wouldn't have covered it. Everybody's got enemies. The word of God says, beware when all men speak well of you. Thank God. I've never had to beware one time in my life. I've had some enemies, but I want to tell you this. Every time I do it God's way and I forgive them and I pray, then all of a sudden it kicks in. What kicks in, Pastor? I begin to intercede for them. Father, I thank you that just as you brought me to a place of obedience, you're going to bring them to a place of obedience. Lord, just as you touch their children, you, my children, you're going to touch their children. God, just as you prospered me, you're going to prosper them. Lord God, I pray that they will experience the same grace that you've given me. And you cannot be somebody's prayer partner and enemy at the same time all you have to do is to do this and it will work every 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 time <laughs> hallelujah if someone slaps you on one cheek turn to them the other also you say well that's tough no it isn't when you understand that God hits harder than you do you can give them your little old measly slap back, or you can say, God, they just slapped me. I don't know what you're going to do about it. And I want to tell you something. He will always come to your defense. Now, one time I was asking God, I said, God, I pray that you will deal with this individual. You know what the Lord spoke to me? He said, Denny, he said, I'm not going to deal with them because you're too busy dealing with them. He said, you can either fight or I'll fight, but I'm not going to fight this if you're going to fight it. Let me tell you that when you turn your battles over to the Lord, he will not only vindicate you, he will not only justify you, but he will also use you in the redemptive process of the one that is striking out against you. If you think that's a good thing, somebody give the Lord praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Now, what this is saying is, is important, especially you business people. Some of you are under the misguided misconception that you made your money. It reminds me of the guy, that, the scientist that said, I have discovered a way to create life. And God said, okay, let's see what you got. And the man said, well... You see, I'm going to take this dirt, and God said, no, 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 get your own dirt. <laughs> I want to ask you this, sir. That money you earned, with whose brain? With whose health? The very fact that you can stand up in the morning and even get to work, do you understand that that doesn't belong to you? Some of you are so proud of yourselves. I'm proud of you. I'm sure the Lord's proud of you, but maybe you're a little too proud of yourself because you think that you are the major factor. Let me say this to you. Pastor Rodney Duran, our apostle and founder, made it very clear to us what our mantra of life should be as believers. The best is yet to come, but mm, to God be the glory. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Never, ever, listen to me. Never, ever, ever, if you want to live a life of forgiveness, never, ever, ever love things more than people. Don't lose relationships over money. Don't lose relationships over things. Never let things matter to you more than people. I had a friend of mine was starting a surefire business, and he needed investors. I gave him a lot of money, more than I've ever given anybody in my whole life. And I didn't have a lot. In fact, it was our part of our retirement. I, I gave him this money, and he didn't do with it what he said he was going to do with it. 
And everything rose up in me to be so angry. And you know what the Lord spoke to me? He said, forgive him. And he said, don't you ever, ever prefer money over people. I have been privileged to walk through that man through the toughest times of his life. And today we're the closest friends. You say, did he ever give us your money back? No. Did he ever offer? No. Well, what in the world? I'll tell you what in the world. I will never, ever prefer money over people. And that was a hard lesson to learn. But when I learned it, I can tell you I'm cured. And you need to be cured too. Because Jesus didn't die for money. He died for people. Always prefer people over money. Here's the last thing that the Word of God teaches us. Forgive until you are free. Forgive until you are free. Forgiveness is a battle, and sometimes battles last a while. But if you forgive and you relentlessly forgive, Sometimes it'll take days, sometimes it'll take weeks, months, and let me just tell you this, sometimes it'll take years. Sometimes you feel like it's going to take your whole lifetime, but it won't. If you relentlessly pursue what I'm telling you, the day will come that when you hear that person's name, there will not even be a ripple of emotion that will travel across your spirit. You will be completely free. The day will come when you see them in public and you'll be able to walk right over to them and shake their hand and look them in the eye and there won't be anything between you really. You will no longer be doing the Word of God by faith. It will be a reality in your emotions as well because your feelings will follow facts and what you have done. But listen to me. Don't say I've forgiven them and still feel something because that means you haven't truly forgiven yet. No, you, you're in the battle. You're in the process but God doesn't want to leave you with those miserable feelings. He wants you to be completely free of them all. And that involves spiritual warfare. I am in the process of forgiving and I will forgive until the thoughts are gone. I will forgive until the feelings are gone. And I will even one day be able to share this story with no malice. Because I will have truly, completely, totally forgiven and that's the will of God for your life God wants to release you emotionally to the place that when you think about the offense you no longer curse it you no longer nurse it and you no longer rehearse it you are free it's the key to your health stand with me please all over this place Hallelujah. Everybody here that says, that hit me and I'm in. Get out of your seats and come forward. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray an empowering prayer over you. You'll say, that hit me and I'm in right now. Right now, I'm in. Come on. I told you it was going to hit everybody at one time or another. Some of you aren't struggling right now, but some of you are. Come on, step out. Come forward and stand in front of the That hit me and I'm in. That hit me, and I am in, Pastor. I am so in. I am so in here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Praise God. Praise God. I was with a man the other day who I gave the money to. He's dying. And as I sat across the table at coffee from him, I was able to put my arm on his, my hand on his shoulder. I was so grateful. I said, God, thank you that I didn't miss this. I'm going to get to walk with him through the last days of his life as a close comrade and friend. You see, here's what you have to understand is that God really loves people, all of them. And when you become a Christian, you're supposed to be His extension. So people should say this about you in your life. I've never seen anybody love like they love unconditionally. And such a focused 
authentic manner. They love. They should be able to say, I've watched them walk through stuff. Man, it's crazy. But oh, they just keep loving. Hallelujah. How many of you want that new depth in God that we're talking about here? You want the new depth in God. Come on, lift your hands. This is the way to get there. There will be more gifts that will manifest. There will be more power that will flow through you than you've ever known in your life. You will begin to see authority in your life like you've never. Come on, lift both hands to the Lord right now and say, Lord God, here I am. Here I am. Begin a new work in me. Lord Jesus, begin a new work in me. Say, please forgive me. Forgive me, Lord God, as I forgive others. And say, Lord, I've never been more willing to forgive than now. I've never been more willing to forgive than right now, standing right here. Say, Lord, I want to do forgiveness. I want to do forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you. And I want to live a life of forgiveness. I want to live a life, Lord God, of letting people go after they've offended me, after they've willfully hurt me, letting them go. Lord God, I release them. I release them. As Esau released Jacob, Lord God, I celebrate even those that have hurt me in the past. Lord God, as Joseph released his brothers, I, Lord, I thank you that you had a plan, even in the offense, to take me to a new place. Oh, I give you glory. I give you glory. I give you honor.